hi again. Welcome to the uh, YouTube blog of Independent Science News. My name is Jonathan Latham and I'm the editor of that website which you can visit at www.independentsciencenews.org. So this week I want to talk about the Poison Papers. So the Poison Papers is a document dump that we curated along with the Center for Media and Democracy and uh, which we put online as uh, you know, a kind of chemical equivalent of WikiLeaks, if you like. And so, so what we did was uh, we obtained these documents uh, from an activist called Carol Van Straub. She is the source of most of these documents. And she, is a, she basically collected these documents over a period of about 40 years, since the uh, early 1970s. She's been collecting information about the chemical industry and the regulation of the chemical industry. And what got her interested in all, this whole subject was, uh, was basically her family was sprayed in, the, you know, in their garden. They live in Oregon and this was for basically forest spraying of Agent Orange. And her children became sick. She became sick. And this happened on multiple occasions. And so she tried to get information from the EPA, from uh, government agencies, from the Bureau of Land Management about uh, the, uh, essentially what, you know, in the first instance, to try to find out what they were being sprayed with. So what, you know, what they noticed was not only that her family became sick, they noticed patterns of miscarriages in their, in their valleys, uh, which followed spraying incidents. Right? In the you know certain times of the year they'd be spraying and and they was, these would be followed by by miscarriages. So this is really troubling data, you know. But it obviously it parallels what happened in, in you know pretty closely to what happened in Vietnam. And they also noticed, for example, uh, you know it was being reported. You know the poison papers show that it was being reported by you know forest managers that unusual you know deformed elk and so forth were being born in the forest and so forth you know it was really uh you know the whole lot of troubling stuff is going on but epa and other government officials would not tell them what was going on would uh would insist that these chemicals are safe and so on and so forth and you know the the people in oregon many people in oregon convinced themselves that the, that was totally was not true so, so they had a story, EPA had a story, and Carol basically set out to find out whether EPA really knew differently. And so she launched all sorts of uh, attempts to get information from EPA about their internal documents. So these are Freedom of Information Act requests. Eventually she came into contact with whistleblowers, with lawyers who had access to uh, all kinds of uh, legal discovery documents right of these cases and she helped to initiate some of these cases she worked on some of these cases she provided uh, assistance to lawyers for example who were suing Monsanto in the end about PCBs about dioxins about uh, Agent Orange so Agent Orange by the way is 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T so it was basically a combination of those two herbicides and largely because of her efforts 2,4-5-T was banned and, uh, and Carol Van Strom, her efforts and her husband's efforts um, to, to basically ferret out information, you know, and they were helped by Greenpeace and other, you know, non-profits. But essentially her efforts, you know, led to an important thing, which was, which was an acknowledgement that 245T was a hazardous chemical and was contaminated with dioxins and that this was, uh, this was harming um, this was causing harm in those forests. So it led to a kind of institutional recognition of that. And essentially the poison papers are all the documents that Carol collected together and had in her barn and still, still, you know, until uh, a year ago, had in her barn, but basically were papers, right? They were, um, they were papers that, uh, you know, no person they were, they were basically lost to the internet right and so what happened was Carol was writing an article for our website the independent science news website and she was making allegations about uh, essentially collusion between EPA and the chemical industry and and I said to Carol these are really important allegations but you need to be able to support them 
And she would say to me, oh, you know, of course it's in my barn or whatever, these documents. And, and so, so, and I said, well, Carol, I, you know, I need to see these documents. You know, we can't make allegations like this without actually uh, having the real document. You know, it took me a while to figure out a way to Binance getting these documents put online. But finally, uh, we did it in uh, July of 2017. We got all these documents, it's two, basically two and a half tons of paper, and, uh, which is nearly 250,000 pages. We now have them online and, uh, and they're basically available for people, researchers, academics, journalists, um, uh, and, and you know, ordinary members of the public who want to know what happens inside regulatory agencies, right? Because no one knows what happens inside regulatory agencies. We hear, we hear two things. We hear the official spin and we hear, uh, we hear um, uh, the opinions of whistleblowers. Right? And very little other, uh, other kinds of information uh, per per percolates outside of those agencies. And uh, the, you know, what's really interesting about the stories that percolate outside of the agency is that, uh, you know, which are basically accepted. The accepted, there's an accepted story, right? The accepted story is that there are, um, EPA is an agency that is engaged in protecting the public from harm and that uh, there, but there are people, there are bad people inside EPA and these, e these people are, you know, hired by or politically appoint, hired by the chemical industry or are political appointees or attempting to stop the agency from doing its, doing its job or who are, you know, part and parcel of the revolving door. So we hear about Michael Taylor all the time at FDA, for example. So, so this is the narrative, the grand narrative that we have of our environmental agencies. And the story of the poison papers, a story that Carol uh, um, basically uncovered, is that that's not how agencies function, right? Agencies, environmental agencies, uh, essentially function in the way that you predict if they were full of yes men and women, right? And this is the historical narrative of bureaucracy ever since, uh, you know, kings were invented, right? Which is basically, basically uh, bureaucrats tell their bosses what they would like to hear, right? And what they'd like to hear is they don't want to be troubled by uh, problematic stories. And this is why in ancient narratives you have this story of the emperor who goes incognito. He's always told by his, his courtiers that everybody in his empire is happy and that he, uh, and he shouldn't worry his little head about famines and things like that because everything's on track and the people in, in the countryside are becoming richer and they all love him and so on and so forth. So that's why you have all these old stories of people's folk mythology where the emperor basically has to go incognito, sneak out of the palace, go into the fields and, and towns and try to work out whether it's really true or not. And so the emperor goes and talks to people and, and discovers usually that uh, actually the people are not happy, the people are not welfare, the people are not content. And, and so he goes back and then he fires all his bureaucrats, right? And this is the age old story of bureaucracy. And so essentially the narrative that we're normally told about EPA is completely different from the narrative of the age old story of, of how bureaucrats function, right? The bureaucrats are basically yes men. And, and uh, the story of the poison papers, and I, I'll finish here, but, but the story of the poison papers, the parts that we have managed to look at, because we're talking about 250,000 pages here, the story of the poison papers is basically that EPA does not fit the narrative that you will hear from the National Resources Defense Council or, or the Environmental Working Group about bad actor chemicals and bad actor people who work at the EPA. Essentially, the whole agency is corrupt. Okay, The whole agency is full of yes people who are basically doing the bidding of the chemical industry. Right? The EPA, in the stories that come out of the poison papers, which are actually the internal memos of that agency, 
are ba is basically that the agency hardly does anything else except try to work out how to to cover up the crimes and problems of the chemical industry. And so this is an incredibly important set of uh, papers that we hope will stimulate a lot of interest, a lot of research, and hopefully a lot of soul searching in the environmental movement, and especially the mainstream environmental movement, but also the media, right? Why, why is the media not covering all this interesting information? And why does the media perpetuate this story? of the bad actors and the rotten eggs, right? This is, a this is a fundamental issue. And it goes to the heart of the whole functioning of government, right? This applies to FDA, this applies to the Bureau of Land Management, it applies to, to every agency, OSHA, every agency that's involved in protecting the public and has to basically watch its back because there's a, there's a, you know, there are basically regulated industries out there like the coal industry and so on and so forth that would like to basically corrupt those institutions, and, and invariably they do. And so, so this is a, these are a really important set of documents that, that re represent one of the best sources that we have, have ever managed to lay our hands on, of what really happens inside regulatory agencies and the US government. So thanks very much for listening, and I hope we'll see you next week.